Well, Paul, that was depressing. I mean, those uh, angles are so small. We're never going to see anything like we see in cosmology where you can see, you know, the lens split and, and give you an angle that's actually measurable on a telescope. Yeah, it is a bit depressing. But if you think about it, splitting the image while very neat is not the only thing that lensing does. It also actually focuses the light on the Earth so it makes things brighter, it amplifies things. Oh, well, that is true because this is one of the techniques we use is not just to you know, see that this exists. We actually use this to magnify background galaxies so we can see things much further away than we otherwise would. Yep, so how are we going to calculate this? Well, the way you do it, or the most common way, is ray tracing. The idea is we have a background source here and we fire, fire out photons at random directions uh, past our dark thing, our planet, whatever it is, towards the Earth. And we have it draw an imaginary plane through the Earth and we count where each of these photons arrives. And you see, whenever the photon gets near here, it's deflected. The ones that are very close in are deflected a lot, because the equation had a 1 over r in it for the deflection angle. Um, the ones that are further away are deflected less. And so we end up with a pattern over there in the background. OK, so in this case, you shoot things all out. And presumably, you're shooting them out this direction, but we don't care about those. So yeah. the ones that come by and through here collect. Now, if there was no star here when yeah. you do this, you just end up with the same number of rays anywhere on this side of the diagram that yep. you would have. But this changes that and gives you perhaps a different pattern over here. Yep, it's acting a bit like a lens, but a rather crap lens. Yep. Um, so here's an example of a crap lens, my water bottle. You can see it's focus of sunlight coming through it into a rather weirdo pattern over there. It's got sort of almost lines and caustics and things over there. Right, and so uh, a real gravitational lens, maybe more analogous, is more like a uh, funnel of glass where, uh, you know, it, there's sort of this, this little thing of glass that spreads out and it gives you a pattern very similar to what a gravitational lens looks like. Okay, so we can simulate this. The way we do it is go back to the firing rays and we now do it in three dimensions. So what I've done is I've put in the background a source that's firing photons out in all directions, and I've put a foreground mass, a stellar mass this time, and that's bent some of the light, the light that came close but not bent the light that's further away, and then I've put an imaginary plane where the Earth is, and here I've counted, I've done I think about 10 million points here. So you sort of have this, this plane which is your target, it's like shooting arrows, Yes. and the arrows get bent, and wherever the arrow hits, boom, you get a little dot here. Yeah. And so you don't end up with a uniform pattern anymore when you take into account that ray tracing. Yes, what you find is the rays that come very close to the planet are deflected away often, so they're actually probably off the plot in different directions. Yeah. The ones that go a very long way just end up where they're going to end up anyway. What happens is the ones that are sort of intermediate distance, just the right angle, get focused rather vaguely towards the middle. It's not a very sharp image, but a rather blurry image in the middle. Okay, so if we are here on Earth looking at a object directly lined up with another object, like you've seen, mm -hmm. then that's why we'd be right in the center then we're going to get a lot more light from that star than if we're off here. So it's going to appear brighter. That's right. But of course, this is space and everything is moving. I mean, the background star is moving in the bulge of the galaxy. Um, whatever this lensing star or planet is moving, and we're moving. So we have three motions. We've got the star, the other star, and, and us. us. Yes. So that's three motions, but probably all more or less traveling on straight lines, at least over a few days. I mean, you can break up the Earth's motion and our Sun's motion in straight lines. So we have three straight lines pointing in different directions. So you just add them up, the normal vector sum, yeah. and you're just gonna get one line. You add three lines together, you're gonna get one line. So what that means is you've got this plane, which is this image, and that's gonna move across the Earth, and the Earth's gonna move across that. Um, and so you can, like pretend that the plane is stationary and the Earth is moving, or pretend that the Earth is stationary and the plane is moving. It's usually easiest just to assume this is stationary and calculate with respect to this image plane where the Earth is moving. All right, so we can break it down, all those motions into one motion, and then we're going to plot yep. how that plane moves across the sky. Yep, so it could be the Earth's going to go up here or down there or something like that. If the Earth just, say, goes over here, it's not going to see very much. It's so far away, there's not much magnification. And presumably, we don't care about the angle. This looks like it's completely round in this case. Yep. So let's put a random motion in here. Let's say that the Earth moved across this image plane like this. Oh, okay. Of course, the reality would be that the, the, all three things are moving, but right. um, we can approximate that as everything being stationary. So what would happen here? 
when we're out here, we're going to see the normal brightness of the subject. Um, but when we get here, if you look, you'll see there are more dots per unit area here, which means we're going to get more photons from the subject. And up here, we're getting quite a lot more. So what we can do is we can go along this path and for each point calculate how many photons arrived there. And here's what we get. Okay, so there's kind of a curious looking shape. Mm -hmm. um, it's sort of pointy with little wings out the side. Yeah, it's a bit noisy because I only simulated 10 million particles. I simulated a billion billion or something, which is what you probably really get. You get a nice smooth curve because of the noise we've talked about before. Um, but yes, so what you'd expect to see is over some period of time, in this case it would typically be a few days, yep. um, a star that normally had a particular brightness would appear to get much brighter. So it started off with a brightness of maybe about 50 photons that got to about 500. So in this case it's a magnification of about 10 times. And presumably if you were to come cut across on the, that line, would cut across at a mm -hmm. different point, yeah. you'd get even brighter or fainter. Yeah, if you went right through the middle, very close to it, you'd get right. a much brighter magnification. If you were out here, you might get very small magnification and so on. Okay, so that gives us a clue of maybe of figuring out what's going on and how bright things are. Yeah, so that would be for a star, but we're not really interested in stars. We know stars yeah. exist. Um, a red dwarf star, we might not be able to see it. It would be so much fainter than the background bright star, so we could pick it up from this. So yeah. it might be of some interest, but we really care about is planets. So let's put a planet in front. Yeah. Um, so here's a planet going in front. Okay, so it's a lot less massive, and so the effect is much, much smaller. Okay. Yep, so if you draw a line through this, um, once again, it will depend whether you go right through the middle or further away, but if you went the same sort of distance you went in the last time, you're going to get something like that. All right, so it's a lot fainter. So how are we going to distinguish that from a star? Well, you can't really use the magnification because going right through the middle of a planet give a bigger magnification than going a long way away from a star. What you can use is the time period. This is going up and down in just hours, whereas for a star it's probably going to take uh, days oh, to go okay. up and so down. Okay, so we have two things. We have yeah. the amount of magnification and the time that the magnification yeah. happens. So by combining the two, we can probably work out the sort of mass that's going on. Okay. However, it's a bit more complicated than this because um, if you imagine you do have a star and a planet and a photon of light coming through, it's going to get bent one way by the star and another way by the planet, but the two are going to act together. So for example, if something went right through the middle, it might be able to go straight through. So it's not as simple as taking the pattern from the planet and the pattern from the star and superposing them. So the scale of solar systems is such that you've got to worry about both things at the same time. You don't get to just break it into one or the other. Yeah, it turns out you can really, if you have a planet and a star near each other, in fact any two masses near each other, you get rather interesting patterns. If I've done this movie here, what I've done is I've put a star here and I've moved a planet across on a line through this. And what you can see is the pattern in the image plane. So you really get an interesting pattern which we call a caustic. It's not dissimilar to the pattern at the bottom of a swimming pool. Um, or the pattern for my water bottle. So what you're getting is actually lines you can see along there, which are lines where it so happens that the bending of the two objects cancels out a lot of photons end up at the same place, these so-called caustic lines. What you can see is when the planet's a long way out, it doesn't have much lensing effect, similar to if it was all by itself. When it's right in close, like now, it's actually very much like a star, just lensing. But when it's out a little bit, you get some very interesting, big, caustic patterns all over the place. So that's a very complicated pattern. Mm -hmm. And complicated patterns have the advantage of you can learn a lot, because if you can really see that pattern, mm. then presumably you're going to be able to nail exactly what's going on in the system. Now, to nail this, what we'd need is a two-dimensional array of telescopes spread yep. all over the you several solar systems. If we had telescopes scattered all over space in the light year of us, we could actually measure the brightness here, 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 all over this and do that. We can't do that. What we can rely on, once again, is a track. So for example, let's say we were moving through like this. We're going to hit a caustic here, gl gl glance a caustic there, another one there. And so we can do the same so sort of still calculation. still a very complicated pattern. And here's what you get for this particular situation. Oh, okay, so you get these little blips, and those little blips tell you what the caustic pattern looks like. And that caustic pattern tells you, presumably, how big the planet is relative to the star and where it's orbiting. Yep, so you've got the overall big blip due to the star and superimposed a number of spikes. So what you're going to be looking for is a normal star pattern but with weird spikes in different locations as you cross the caustics in this diagram. But of course, for this to happen, the planet needs to be the right distance. It can't be too close yeah. in case all you're going to see is a star or too far out, you're going to see two quite separate glitches. To get all these neat caustics, you have to be at the right sort of distance in the middle. So let's calculate how far away a planet would need to be for a star to give these neat caustic patterns.